thank you, Father. We give you all the glory. We give you honor. We give you all the glory. We give you honor. Amen. We give you all the glory. of days, the Alpha and the Omega, the one who is, the one who was, the one who is to come, the Almighty, we bless your name. We bless your name for the salvation of our souls. We thank you for keeping us in your love. We thank you for FOL. Thank you for the journey of 25 years. Thank you for preservation. Thank you for those of us who are at the beginning, present, when there were quite a few of us. Thank you for those of us who are still now. Thank you for those who are now with you in glory. Thank you for the souls that have been saved, the sick that have been healed, the captives that have been set free, the barren that have become fruitful. Thank you for answered prayers. Thank you for testimonies. Thank you, Lord, for who you are. Glory be to your holy name. Father, tonight, all over the world where they are listening to us, please do something new. Amen. Do something we will never forget. Amen. Thank you, Almighty. Thank you, In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Amen. 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 Well, let somebody shout hallelujah. Maybe few, but uh, hallelujah should be loud. Let somebody shout hallelujah. hallelujah. <laughs> I remember, please be seated. I remember one of the first things I said 25 years ago when I said uh, somebody should shout hallelujah. Uh, and uh, they shouted at uh, London Arena. I think we were about uh, 2,000 people then. I remember I said to them that that was not a bad hallelujah for London. But I wanted a heavenly hallelujah. An hallelujah that will be heard in heaven. So those of you who are here, and those of you who are listening in all the various stations, I want you to shout hallelujah that God will hear in heaven. Shout hallelujah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. 
Now that's better. But you see, where I come from, my children have a saying. They said, if you want your miracle to be bigger than that of your neighbor, then let your hallelujah be louder than that of your neighbor. Let somebody shout hallelujah. <laughs> God, that's all right. That's, that's better now. God bless you. You can be seated. Uh, 25 years gone. As if it were just 25 days. It was a wonderful time 25 years ago when we had the first FOL. Like I said, we were about 2,000 in number, maybe a little less. But it was uh, a time of great excitement uh, that we could even get about 2,000 people together to pray all night in London it was a miracle then. And God was present. He was present with us. We started at 7 o'clock. When it was 4.30 a.m., I asked the people, can we go home now? And they all shouted, no! So we went on for another one hour. Around 5.30, I said, can we go home now? <laughs> they see, said, no. I said, well, you are sitting down. And I've been standing. I'm going. That's why I'm sitting down tonight. <laughs> so that maybe if I ask you around uh, 6 o'clock, <laughs> shall we go home now? What will be your answer? Glory be to God. Tonight, we're going to pray. As a matter of fact, that's principally the thing that we want to do tonight. And um, the reason we are going to pray tonight is because I wasn't thinking about 25 years anniversary of the FOL when we were thinking of the theme for this year's FOL. And then there were so many themes that were flying around, maybe we should talk about this or talk about that, and all of a sudden the Holy Spirit dropped in my heart, the way theme, a new dawn. And uh, I've studied the theme, I've gone through the scriptures, I've looked at it from all manners of perspectives, newcomers, workers, pastors, and I find that the more I look at the topic, the more I realized that God is saying something to someone. Or at least to two people, myself, or maybe three. Myself, my wife, and somebody else. I believe God is saying something. A new dawn, not just for you as an individual, but a new dawn for your family, a new dawn for your nation, wherever you are over the world, I'm all over the world listening to me. But a new dawn, if we are really going to go deep enough, will really mean a new destiny. Even though 
we will not be going too far into that aspect of it. But I believe that uh, you see, in every man's life there is a day, a day that you will never forget. And many a times, it is long after the day has come that you realize that something happened the night before. For example, the day you got married, it was a beautiful day, a lot of singing and dancing. It takes a while for you to remember the meal you ate before you went to bed the night before. That that was the last meal you ate as a bachelor or as a spinster. The day you dedicate a, your new house, and you are moving in, a lot of celebration. It takes quite a while before you realize that there was a meal you ate before you went to bed that the night previous, which was the last meal you ate as a tenant. Very, very crucial things that we many a times don't quite appreciate. Do you know this is a night somebody will never forget? Yeah. Uh, of course, if you are the one, you will say amen. <laughs> but so what I want to do is, uh, as uh, briefly as I can, do a little bit of uh, Bible study with us to lay the foundation for our prayers. Because we are going to pray. And the praying will take some time. And uh, in order that we might not be thinking of hurrying to bed tonight, that's why I reminded you of the time when we used to finish at uh, 6 a.m. I remember very well that uh, it was our neighbors who came to beg us. At any time we had Holy Ghost service or festival of life, we should please finish before 6 a.m. They had their own reason. They didn't know what we were enjoying. So tonight, we might not end as soon as we expect. If that is okay by you, say amen. Amen! <laughs> the amen was very low. If that is okay by you, say amen. Uh -huh. Even if it is not okay by you, it's already too late. The one holding the mic is the one in charge. Let us define our theme, the new dawn. Two principal words here, dawn and new. Dawn basically means daybreak. Um, I believe that will be good enough as a definition. Why do they call it daybreak? Because daybreak is a combination of two words, day and break. It means there is a break from the past, a break from night, a break from darkness, and then the arrival of day. New automatically simply means the opposite of old. So new dawn means there was probably a dawn before, and now here comes a new one. But you see, the real definition of a new dawn is the fact, or you could say it implies that there was 
day before and then night and then another day you see because between every two days there must be a night you can't jump from one day to another without having a night which is good good news for someone who is going to have a new dawn because it means your night season is about to end Amen. and if you look at Psalm 30 verse 5 therefore Psalm 30 verse 5 we says weeping may endure for a night but joy cometh in the morning it means that someone listening to me anywhere in the world I don't know who you are but for you specifically your season of sorrow is about to end yeah. you know like in Luke chapter 7 from verse 11 to 15 Luke 7 from verse 11 to 15 the Bible tells us the story of a widow in a city called Nain who was going to bury her only son this widow knew joy before she knew joy the day she got married she knew joy the day this son was born but then her day came to an abrupt end when the husband died but then she kept on managing with the only son and then the son died so if we talk of someone who was in a night season it was that widow but as she was going towards the burial ground the one who is called the bright and morning star was coming from the other side and when light lies with darkness darkness must give way so let me start by decreeing into the life of someone that even before I finish preaching your own new dawn will come um, the young man who took the offering was talking about Genesis chapter 18 you can read it from verse 1 to 14 and, and it tells us the story of a man and a woman who had known sorrow consistently for at least some 90 years unknown to them as they woke up that day they did not know that their weeping is just about to be replaced with a laughter a laughter that was to last forever may I decree into the life of somebody that the joy God will release into your life as a result of this meeting will be an everlasting one you see because <laughs> the Bible spoke in Isaiah 35 verse 10 Isaiah 35 verse 10 it, it caused some it talks about something called everlasting joy he said the redeemer of the Lord shall return unto Zion with singing an everlasting joy shall be upon their heads I'm convinced beyond all doubts that there is at least someone listening to me who will never weep again 
However, Don want to take it a little bit uh, out of the physical now into maybe a little bit of shall we say theology plus philosophy simple one um, don't be alarmed the word done could mean understanding like when you say it dawned on me I suddenly began to understand that's what it means I mean like in Luke chapter 15 you can read the story from verse 11 to 24 Luke 15 from verse 11 to 24 tells us the story of the prodigal son you know the story very well it, it, it was comfortable before when he was in his father's house and then he left home with a lot of money and he began to really enjoy life and then his night came when he spent everything and it was as if the devil was waiting for him to finish everything before a famine came and, and now he knew hunger to the extent that he was willing to feed swine and even join the swine in eating but somehow uh, his wages did not include even the food of the swine then the bible said he came unto himself it dawned on him ah i shouldn't sit down here i should go back home he went back home and things were never the same again you know for years christians believed that if you are sick and the doctors tried and nothing seemed to be happening as a christian you should say ah maybe this is a cross that god wants me to carry many christians died because it never dawned on them that god is not the author of sickness mm. it took a while before it dawned on us that Acts chapter 10 verse 38 Acts chapter 10 verse 38 talks about how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil for God was with him It took quite a while to fully understand that passage. Because the moment you understand that passage, you will be able to tell the devil, take away your sickness. This is not my cross. Sickness is not of God. You need to fully understand that. Because with that understanding, before tomorrow morning, in the name that's above every other name, oh, you become fully whole. Amen. Because if sickness is of God, how come Jesus went about healing all that were oppressed? oppressed of the devil how come his father went about with him everywhere jesus went healing god the father was there saying i back you up until you get that understanding that sickness is not my portion 
you might get to a stage where you begin to surrender to the oppression of the devil. You might get to a stage where you begin to agree when they tell you that what is happening to you is as a result of old age. The Almighty God never said that when you grow older, you become sicker. You need to fully understand when you go through the scriptures that everything the Bible teaches is that God is eager to heal you. And I believe God is talking to somebody in particular. You might even be listening to me now in the hospital. Or you might be home after the doctors have told you, just go and get ready to die. You are going to have a new dawn. Because when you read Luke chapter 13 from verse 11 to 17, Luke 13 from verse 11 to 17, Jesus Christ clearly told us the spirit of infirmity is a bondage of the devil. And he came along and dealt with that spirit of infirmity because he is the great healer. Oh yes, it is true that some sicknesses and diseases can be traced to sin. That is true. Because when, if you continue to live in sin, you are walking in the domain of the devil. But when you read stories like Mark chapter 2, from verse 1 to 12, Mark 2 from verse 1 to 12, when they brought in a boy through the roof, Jesus was eager to heal him, but he knew that sin might be an obstruction. So he forgave him first. Son, thy sins be forgiven thee. He is still the Savior. He is still forgiven sins today. So if there is any sin in your life that could block your healing tonight, in that name that's above every other name, I decree be forgiven. We even discover something more interesting in John chapter 5 from verse 2 to 14. John 5 from verse 2 to 14. It tells us the story of a man who had been sick for 38 years. That's good news for those of you who have been sick for a long time because a new dawn is coming now. Amen. Jesus healed him first. Before he even spoke to him about sin at all. He just went to him, will you be made whole? And the man began to tell the story. I've been here for a long time. He said, all right, all right. Let's forget the story. Just get up and be healed. It was later that he now saw him and said, okay, oh, you'll be made whole. <laughs> On credit. Go and say no more. God wants to heal you. And I am decreeing in the name of the one who sent me this very festival of life. We bring healings to countless thousands of people. Amen. If you receive that, say amen. amen. Even before I finish talking, there will be somebody listening to me who will suddenly discover, because like someone said, one beautiful thing about the healing of God is that many a times you don't even know when it has happened. For someone now, it's already happening. Amen. Now we're talking about dawn being understanding. You know that for a long, long time, We were deceived into thinking that holiness and poverty go hand in hand. Oh, they quote to, to us, 
if you they, they said money is the root of all evil i've been quoted several times whereas what the bible said is the love of money is the root of all evil and so they said if you are really really going to heaven you need to be poor you will be amazed that that was around very much on ground around the time when i got born again so it's still starting as if it was too long ago i mean in those days to be a true believer you are not expected to have more than two trousers and maybe two or three shirts your if you have a car it must be pretty old to ride in any car other than Volkswagen I'm talking of the in those days when I got born again you looked at as a backslider fortunately for me I listen more to God than to man because I, I <laughs> in those days I bought a brand new Toyota Crown. And there were people who thought I was backsliding. But somehow, somehow, I knew then that you can be the richest person in the world and make it to heaven. And you can be the poorest man in the world and go to hell. That what will determine whether you get to heaven or not is not how much money you have. Somehow, I got an understanding. Like, my wife prayed for you tonight. It is written in Third John verse 2. Third John verse 2. I wish above all things that you prosper and be in health, even as your soul prospers. Maybe because I was a mathematician. I was able to put that down mathematically. God says your prosperity will be in direct proportion to your holiness. The closer you are to me, the more your soul prospers, the more you will prosper materially. That's it's, it's what is written. The more you, you prosper, your soul prospers, the healthier you are to become. I saw that. I grabbed it. If you have seen that before now, congratulations. If you have not, you better grab it now. Don't let the sacrifice of Jesus Christ over you be in vain. Because I read in the scriptures, the reason he became poor is so that we can be rich. But the devil was aware that we will not be able to spread the gospel as quickly as we ought to if we don't have resources. If he can keep us poor, then we won't be able to move as fast as we ought to. But in the name that's above every other name, poverty is going to leave you alone. Amen. The way you say amen shows that you are not interested. <laughs> what God said is that you are not to fall in love with material things. First John chapter 2 from verse 15 to 17. First John 2, 15 to 17. It says, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. Don't let possessions possess you. That's what he's saying. It's not saying don't have. He's saying whatever you have should not become your controller. Let me give you an example. There was a time I had two cars. One was a Lexus Jeep. The other was Lincoln Navigator Jeep. 
Um, and I'm telling you, in those days, those who are good cars. And then I was praying for a program. And suddenly God spoke to me and said, Son, I want you to give me your two cars. I want to tell you the truth. I pretended I didn't hear. So I said, which one? Which of the two? Because the little I know about the scriptures, you said if, if I have two quotes, I can give one. So you didn't say I will give the two. So I said, which one? He said, both. All he wanted to do is to find out. Are my cars now possessing me? Thank God I passed the exam. I gave out the two. <laughs> and for months, I had to go about in a bus. But then he responded. The moment he knows that he is the one I love, he responded. I mean, it got to a stage when I had to give out, not any instruction from him, but of my own accord, I had to give out 12 cars, mainly new, so that there would be room to pack other ones. From time to time, he would check are your possessions possessing you? You remember what he did to Abraham? Abraham, yes, Lord. Take your son, Isaac. Your only son. As if he's rubbing it in. Whom you love. And go and sacrifice him to me. God does not eat children for breakfast. But he wants to know, Abraham, have you now fallen in love so much with Isaac that he's taking my place in your life? Thank God for that song that was written, that was written and sung by one of my daughters. No, God, no other God can take your place because you are the one I love. That's what God wants to know. As soon as that is said to he will prosper you. The truth of the matter is that God is not in any difficulty prospering all his children. He has no problem making you millionaires or billionaires. That's no problem with him at all. The earth is the loss and the fullness thereof. The bank in heaven is never closed. He says in Matthew chapter 6 from verse 28 to 33, Matthew 6, 28 to 33, he said, Just seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. All these things, everything you can ever need will be added. That's what he said. As a matter of fact, in Psalm 35, verse 27, Psalm 35, verse 27, the Bible says God has pleasure in the prosperity of his people. When Solomon put God first, God blessed him so much that the Bible said, at a stage, he said, I don't want to see silver in my palace. When silver comes, put it in the backyard. Only gold must come in here. And then in addition, he got wisdom, he got long life, he got peace. Do you know Solomon never fought a single war? And he was the richest in his day. In the, mass, in the name that's above every other name, you will prosper. If you just get the understanding that God has no plan for you to be poor. You must get that understanding because of the new dawn. 
so that a day will come when you will say to the bank manager, behave, otherwise I will withdraw my money. And if I take all my money out of your bank, you know what is going to happen. If you receive that, say amen. amen. Uh, now, I'm fully aware that some of you cannot see how that can possibly be. But please take note. I am not just talking to you for the fun of talking to you. I am prophesying into your future. I've said this before. Those of you who are with us from day number one, you can look back and see some of the things that I said then that sounded 100% impossible. Because at that time when we were so few, majority of us were illegal immigrants. I said that one of these days, Royalty will come and worship with us. <laughs> they, they said amen. Oh, Prime Minister will come and worship with us. Amen. In a garden of immigrants. But I thank God I saw a clip that showed how many of them had already come. Let me assure you, not long from now, you'll be lending to nations. Amen. Now, but a new dawn could also mean a new vision. What do you mean by that? When somebody has been trying to explain something to you, and you find you've been struggling to understand. When all of a sudden the understanding comes, you say, I see. I see. It means, ah, now I get the point. That means there is a link between a new dawn and a new vision. I mean, that should be easy to understand. After all, when daybreak comes, there is light, and then the ability to see becomes easier. You can see things more clearly, uh, particularly early in the morning. In other words, this new dawn we are talking about is about to bring new visions to some people. You know a lot about visions. You know Proverbs 29, verse 18. Proverbs 29, verse 18 says, where there's no vision, people perish. You know, some of us have no vision of greatness. That's one of the ways the devil has cheated us in the past. We, we felt that... Uh, uh, what, what is a Christian doing wanting to be prime minister? I mean, it, it took quite a while before you could see a Christian who wants to even be a counselor. But there's going to be a new vision. Because when your vision is dim, if your vision is limited, you can make very costly mistake. For example, in, in Genesis 27, you read it from verse 1 to 33. Genesis 27 from verse 1 to 33. The reason Isaac made the mistake in blessing Jacob instead of Esau was because the Bible said his vision was dim. When your vision is limited, you can make very dangerous mistakes. When your vision is wrong, you are in danger. You may not believe what I'm telling you, but in one of the nations, you know by the grace of God, 
The Redeemed Christian Church of God is in more than 190 nations of the world. Now, that one takes vision. <laughs> that a church could start in Africa and spread throughout the world, that takes some vision. But in one of the nations, you can interview the natives. When you grow up, what do you want to become? And you'll be shocked at what they say. One boy said, uh, I want to be like my father. Uh, that's good. Uh, what, what, who is your father? What's he? Oh, he's a night guard. You are telling me that when you grow up, all you want to be is a night guard? He said, yes. One guy said, I want to be like my mom. And what's your mom? House help. When someone's vision is that he can never be anything other than a messenger, you know we have a problem. Is there anyone among you who believes that with God's help, you can become the greatest? Yeah. Let me hear you say amen then. Yeah. Mm. When your vision is wrong, you can be in danger. And if you read Genesis chapter 13 from verse 14 to 18, Genesis 13 from verse 14 to 18, you will notice that God said to Abraham, enlarge your vision and I will enlarge your coast. Whatever you can see, you can have. My beloved children, please listen to me. You can take over the world for Jesus Christ. We have enough numbers, even as small as we are now, to take over the world for Jesus. If only we can enlarge our vision. But let's move a little closer and look at one aspect of vision that has to do with understanding. In Numbers chapter 13 from verse 25 to 33, Numbers 13 from verse 25 to 33, the, the spies that Moses sent to go and spy the land before the moving, came back and said, oh, the land is flowing with milk and honey, but there are giants in the land. What do you expect? If a land is flowing with milk and honey, that kind of land is not likely to produce wolves, uh, dwarfs. There's plenty of food, plenty of milk and honey. It's definitely giants should be there. You want to take over the world for Jesus Christ. You need to know that there will be giants in the land. That there will be oppositions. I've heard children of God quoting the scriptures, the wealth of sinners are laid up for the just. <laughs> so, you expect that uh, the sinners will just walk to your house and say, take my money. If you are going to possess your possessions, if you are going to be what God planned for you to be, you need to realize there will be war to fight. That's what Caleb and Joshua said. 
in Numbers 14 from verse 6 to 9. Numbers 14, 6 to 9. He hey, don't worry. We know there are giants in there, but if God be for us, there will be bread for us. <laughs> it takes a clear vision to say, we want to take the gospel to Libya or Iraq or Iran. And whether you believe it or not, we are in all these nations. <laughs> As a matter of fact, by, by the last count, we have more than 16 branches in Libya. Are we fighting battles there? Of course, you don't expect that you will just walk in to a nation like that and take it over for Jesus Christ. You have to war on your knees. You have to fast. You have to pray. And God is ready to back you up, but you have to call on him. Didn't he say, call on me and I will answer you? Don't you know the meaning of that? Don't call and you, go, you don't get an answer. New dawn of understanding. We want to win United Kingdom for Jesus Christ. And it's going to happen. But you have to tell your stomach not to stand in the way. <laughs> Amen became very low. Amen. I told you this is a very special Holy Ghost, uh, special festival of life. This one is the one that will change your destiny. Amen. Because it's going to change your understanding. It's going to change your vision. It's going to bring you into a new dawn. Mm. Now, uh, I want to jump one or two things because uh, they might not be, they might be too heavy for some of you. Let, let, let me just focus on you as an individual now. Because, um, as I've always told you, God is a God of individuals. Um, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever, one person, behold, I stand at the door and I knock, if any man will hear my voice. So let, let me talk to you as an individual now. Your new dawn. Coming for somebody who has been listening to me since I started is a new dawn of health. Amen. There is a difference between healing and health. You need to get a new understanding of that. Healing means you are sick and you are healed. Health means you don't even have to be sick anymore. There are some of you who see, believe that sooner or later you will fall sick. You don't have to be sick to die. I've told you that one before. Let me give you an example. Second Kings chapter 5 from verse 1 to 14. Second Kings 5 from verse 1 to 14. He's talking about a man called Naaman. He wasn't born a leper, which means he knew health before. Otherwise, he would not join the army. They won't. They won't. They won't enroll a leper into the army, and then he rose and became a general. He was a strong, healthy man once. Then leprosy came. How it came, the Bible didn't tell us. Just as many a times 
Some people who have cancer, they won't even know when that demon crept in. And in the name that's above every other name, I curse cancer in the life of every one of God's children. <laughs> now, when Naaman was healed, the Bible told us that his king came back to him as that of a brand new child, brand new baby. There is no record that Naaman was ever sick again. Not only was he healed, because if you, if you heal a leper through medicine, the fingers that had broken off will not come back. The scars of leprosy will be there. In the case of Naaman, well, he wasn't just healed, he was made whole. And so I'm decreeing on the foundation of the word of God that tonight you will not just be healed, you'll be made whole. Yeah. And you will never know sickness again. Yeah. When you read Mark chapter 8, from verse 22 to 25, Mark 8, 22 to 25, the Bible tells us the story of a man who was blind. They brought him to Jesus. He touched him. Asked him what, you know, his part on his face, touched him and said, what can you see? He said, I see men like trees. What does that tell you? He tells us that this man used to see. He had seen trees before. He had seen men before. He, that's, he could recognize trees and men. And when the Lord touched him the second time, ah, he now became whole. He can now see clearly. And he never lost his vision again. It might be difficult for you to swallow. Just say amen in agreement with me that there are some of you today who are using a very specialized kind of eyeglasses, you won't need them anymore. Yeah. Because uh, in the name that's above every other name, whatever is blocking your light, the Almighty God will remove. Yeah. No, the Bible says the eyes are the light of the body. Now, so you... As an individual, if you can receive it, can have a new dawn of health. Then you can have a new dawn of divine provision. Now when we talk about financial breakthrough, many a times you sit down and try to figure it out. How can I ever get to that stage where I will begin to learn to nations? What am I going to be doing? Anytime we are talking about divine provision, put your brain aside. Because miracles don't... Uh, let me put it this way. Miracles can never really be explained. If it can be explained, it's not a miracle. You can never use your brain to explain God. I've seen God in action, brethren. I've been working with him now since 1973. I've seen things happen that some of the testimonies I can share. Because when I share some of them, people will say, mm, okay. <laughs> it was like a man who left the church in America because he was told that there is an auditorium somewhere in Nigeria where you have to drive, you can drive a truck through. He said, a church We are." Vehicles can be walk, moving. So these people, they, they are liars. 
I have seen a man who sat listening to me as you are listening, who has the faith of a child. Miracles were happening around the altar. It was a short man. And uh, when a miracle happens and he wants to see somebody who's sitting in front of him who is taller, will block his sight. He wants to see another one, another one blocked his sight. He said to God in his heart, How I wish I were taller. He said it in the congregation. God had related it to me. I said, There is someone in the congregation who said, I wish I were taller. God said, Tell him to look down. If he finds that his trouser has become shorter, there's nothing wrong with the trouser. He is the one who had grown. I made the announcement. It was testimony time. He came forward with his wife. The wife said, I know where my husband was when we left home. <laughs> Hey, this is where he is now. And do you explain that? So I, 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 I want you to think along with me in preparation for this new dawn that we are going to take God into consideration. And this is not, we are not talking about how we will do it. All we are saying is we are waiting to see how he will do it. For example, in Matthew chapter 6, if we read it from verse 9 to 13, Matthew 6 from verse 9 to 13, this might help you. When the Lord was teaching the disciples to pray, he made a statement there that should teach you something. Give us this day our daily bread. You know the implication of that? Without God's assistance, you can't even get your daily bread. Oh, you may say, uh -uh. <laughs> I have a job. I go to work. That's why they pay me my salaries. And that's why I get the money to, to feed myself and my family. If you consider the fact that you may get to the place of work and they just say, they don't, we don't want you anymore. I know a man who had three PhDs and couldn't get a job. Three PhDs. Until he came to Jesus and we prayed a simple prayer. And before he got home, he got several phone calls. He had attended all manners of interviews. How can you have three PADs? And people will not find one that they want. <laughs> it is just like mommy quoted in Romans chapter 9, verse 16. Romans 9, 16. It is not of him that willeth, nor of him that runneth, but of God that showeth mercy. Just imagine the story in Second Kings chapter four, from verse one to seven. Second Kings chapter four, from verse one to seven, when that widow who was destitute came to Elisha and said, "The creditors have come. They've checked me out. They found that there was nothing worth selling in my house, except my sons. Help me." Cry to God for me. And the man of God said, what do you have in the house? You know the story. I have only a pot of oil, small bottle of oil. And he said, go and borrow many empty vessels. Borrow not a few. Lock yourself in there with your children and begin to pour out the oil and set aside that which is full. How can one bottle fill a big pot? And now you are talking of setting aside that which is full. How 
is that one going to be multiplied? That is not your business. Your business is to obey him. Leave the rest to him. When he told me, when I was crying to him for a house, a boy's quarter, and he said, son, I'm going to build you a city. What sense is in that? How much money must I have to build a city? But that's not my headache. My headache is to obey him. Put in God. Do you know that if you allow God to move into your situation, even before the end of the year, you might be richer than you can ever imagine. How is it going to happen? That's not your headache. Leave that out. I believe that somebody listening to me will soon have a testimony. Yeah. And the testimony will be the one we used to joke with when we were younger. My problem is not money. My problem is how to spend it. Yeah. If, you, if you receive that, you will say amen. Let me begin to round up, kind of, so that we can pray, because we want to pray. Let us look forward to a new dawn of spiritual intervention. We've talked about health, because that is important. We've talked about wealth, because that is also important. But let's, let's talk about spiritual intervention as a whole. There is no way anybody can believe without divine intervention. The story that is in Mark chapter 5, from verse 2 to 20. Mark 5, from verse 2 to 20. How can anybody believe that a man so thoroughly mad that he was living in a tomb, we one day become an evangelist for God. Humanly speaking, it doesn't make sense. If he's mad, he's mad. And if he's mad, he's supposed, if he's that kind of mad, the kind of mad that other mad people will see coming and they will run, he's supposed to die mad. But God intervened so I'm decreed into the life of someone this very moment that that divine intervention that will restore your destiny will take place tonight. It was a new dawn of divine intervention that changed Peter who you could call a failure squared. Um, that's mathematics speaking. He failed as a fisherman. The Lord intervened. Huh? And then he said, okay, I forsake fishing. I will follow the Lord. And then he fell. And he said, well, Let's forget about following Jesus. I go back fishing. And then he failed again. That's why I call him failure squared. But <laughs> by the time God intervened in Acts chapter 2, from verse 1 to 4, Acts 2 from verse 1 to 4, the same failure squared preached a sermon. And 3,000 souls who are saved. And some of you listen to me now. You've done your best in your career. And you have failed. You gave your life to Jesus Christ. And now things worked for the wise. But they don't seem to be working again, so you consider yourself a failure before you came in, a failure after you came in. Ah, don't rule out God. 
There's about to be a new beginning. Amen. A new dawn. Amen. When I became general overseer, and I don't have time to tell you stories tonight because we want to pray. Oh, I tried everything in the book to make the church grow. Nothing worked. Every month I, I had special seminars. Uh, seminar for uh, healing, seminar for deliverance. And I will fast and I will pray. I became almost like a broomstick. During that weekend of emphasis or whatever name I called it there, the people will come. They will be blessed. As soon as we finish, they disappear. I did everything I knew. I attended seminars. I was prayed for by <laughs> people who, who carried anointing. Yeah, they think nothing happened. But when my time came, and your time will come, Amen. a new dawn came. Amen. And it came, and it, that's, that's what, one of the things that makes London so special to me. My new dawn came at number 1111. One, one, one. Uh, what you call this street now? Uh, you remember the name of the street? Anyway, somewhere. Temple Fortune. Temple Fortune. Thank you, my son. He should know if he was the one. <laughs> he was, he was, he was a taxi driver then who used to drive me there. <laughs> I was sitting down there preparing Sunday school material for the, the church at home. It was February to, to, moving towards March when all of a sudden God spoke to me and said, son, what do you want for your birthday? And birthday was coming, it was March 2nd. And I heard his voice, somebody's already hearing God. Tonight, maybe before we finish praying, you will know you are the one who that God has been talking to. To cut a long story short, that's the beginning of Holy Ghost service, which is now called Festival of Life here. That was the turning point. Today now, <laughs> if, if I have any problem, is that I don't have enough time to honor every invitation all over the world to come and hold the Holy Ghost service. They want that one. And all of a sudden, the church began to grow. From tonight onward, all fruitless efforts in your life is coming to an end. Because of divine intervention the purpose of God for your life just as it began to find fulfillment in the case of Peter when God intervened the purpose of God for your life will begin to find fulfillment from now on now it was a new dawn for Saul of Tarsus when he was on the road to Damascus. He was going to deal with all those who are following Christ. But then God intervened and there was a new dawn. There was a light that shone that was brighter than the noonday sun and changed everything in his life. The man who himself called himself the chief of sinners, 1 Timothy chapter 1, 
verse 15. First Timothy chapter 1, verse 15. Ended up becoming the chiefest of the apostles. Second Corinthians 11, verse 5. Second Corinthians 11, verse 5. The chief of sinners became someone whose handkerchiefs will now begin to heal the sick. Acts chapter 19 from verse 11 to 12. Acts 19, 11 to 12. When your own dawn comes, and it's going to come tonight, Amen. not only will you be physically whole, not only will you never borrow again, Amen. but God will so anoint you Amen. that you will become a vessel unto honor in his hand. He will so anoint you that you will be able to heal the sick, Amen. set captives free, Amen. and do mighty things. Amen. And I want you to really think big. I've said it before, but please enlarge your vision. There was a time when if the old redeemed Christian Church of God would gather for convention, on the Friday night of the convention, I would lay hands on everybody. So we must be, <laughs> you will know how many we were then. I mean, I would lay hands on everybody from A to Z. Can I do that now? No. And what has God done to take care of the situation? I saw a vision. I enlarged my vision that I don't need to lay hands for these people to be healed. I don't need to limit myself onto unless I lay hands on you, you can't receive a miracle. I can get to that stage where all I need to do is wave my hand. I lifted my high, my vision higher. And if you can see it, you can have it. Just include God in your calculations. Let me close. Hmm. I said before, between every two days, there, can, there must be a night. But it is possible for a day to last for a thousand years. Which, physically speaking, means that if you move into a new day today, that day will still be there by the time you have gone to heaven to rest. In other words, it is possible for your sun that is going to rise now never to set. Amen. Which is hidden in that statement in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, is a new creature, all things are passed away. How many things become new? All. And he didn't say all things have become new for a while. It can become new forever. Which is why if your day has changed tonight, after you gave your life to Jesus Christ, it means you backslid. You are the one who went back into night. But you have another opportunity today. Come back to light. And if you have never given your life to Jesus Christ, you are in a night season. 
You might think you are enjoying yourself. Ask the prodigal son. He was enjoying himself, not knowing that the devil has set a trap for him, waiting for when everything will dry up, and then he will strike with a famine. So if you are listening to me wherever you are, and you have not yet given your life to Jesus Christ, do so now. Then your own new dawn will begin. That's what happened to me. When I gave my life to Jesus Christ, everything changed. My health changed. I used to be sick every two, two weeks of malaria fever. Because I was a sportsman. I get well and get back into it again every two, two weeks. And I gave my life to Jesus. And things changed. I was so poor. Even though I was a lecturer in the university, I had any salary. I had so many problems eating up my resources that by the middle of the month, I will be borrowing money from my driver. The salary I gave him. I will be borrowing out of it to buy fuel for my car. Then I gave my life to Jesus and everything changed. I gave my life to Jesus Christ. And what do you see? Suddenly you see a mathematician now by the grace of God being used even to raise the dead. The same can happen to you. So if you have not given your life to Jesus Christ, do so today. Let you also have a new dawn. But sliders, come back home. He's still willing. The door is still open. It can take you back into fellowship. You can have a new dawn. So, since I can't see <laughs> majority of you, I know you can see me. You have that advantage. They are going to put for you on the screen or where whatever instrument you are using. Uh, there is something they call the link. <laughs> I'm sure you understand the language. And there is the one they call the QR code. God have mercy. <laughs> if you are giving your life to Jesus Christ, please click on the link. I think on, on my screen, the link is on my left. The QR code is on my right. So you either click on the link or scan the QR code. When you do this as a sign to God that you are giving your life to Jesus Christ, I will get the information that you've given your life to Jesus. And I can assure you, from now, I'll be praying for you. And we'll be able to contact you and send some resources to you to guide you on your new life. Now, we will give two minutes to those who are surrendering their life to Jesus Christ and to backsliders who are coming home to do so, to take the action they need to take. And in the two minutes, those of us who have already given our life to Jesus Christ, I beg you, pray for these new people. Intercede for them. That their decision will be genuine their salvation will be complete and absolute. Pray for backsliders who are coming back home that the almighty God will restore them fully. Just for two minutes, go ahead, talk to the almighty God on behalf of these people. Pray that God will save their souls. Pray that their salvation will be genuine. Pray that they will serve God from now on without looking back. Pray for the backsliders that God will receive them back fully into fellowship with him.
please pray for them. Oh, thank you, Father. Glory be to your name, Lord. Thank you, thank you, thank you. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Amen. Savior of mankind, I want to thank you. Thank you for your word. Thank you, my Father and my God, for all those who have heard your word. I know there is power in your word. Power to save, power to heal, power to restore, power to deliver. As many as are deciding to surrender their life to you today, Lord, please receive them. Save their souls. Let your blood wash away their sins. Receive them into the family of God. And let everything become new for them. As for those who are backsliders, who are coming back home, Lord, Father, please receive them again. And bring them back into fellowship with you one more time. And I pray that they will never backslide again. And all these newcomers, my Father and my God, I pray that from this moment onward, any time they cry unto you, you will answer them by fire. Amen. Thank you, my Lord and my Savior. Glory be to your holy name. Father, in a moment now, all of us, your children, are going to a session of prayer. Please, even as we begin to cry unto you, answer us speedily. Amen. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Amen. 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 Let someone shout hallelujah. Now, I want to give you some prayer points that you are going to pray upon. Um, I want to ask you to pray for one hour, like we do at home, just for a few minutes, with the understanding that as you are going back home, you will pray along. So you want to write down your prayer points now. Prayer point number one. You want to thank God for preservation. Thank him that he preserved you till now. Because if, if you had died before this new dawn, then uh, it won't have any meaning. Thank God for preservation. Then number two, you are going to say, Father, please let my night season end right now. You know, the night season is the, is the night of sorrow, the night of sickness, the night of pain. Father, please let my night season end right now. And then number three, you cry to him and say, Father, let me begin to enjoy a new dawn of health. Let me begin to enjoy a new dawn of health. Number four, Father, please let me begin to enjoy a new dawn of abundance divine abundance. Number five. Father, from now on, let me become a blessing to many 
let me become a blessing to many. Number six. Father, please anoint me greatly. for soul winning with power. Anoint me greatly for soul winning with power to heal the sick to set captives free and even to raise the dead. Number seven. Father, let your light of revival begin to shine through me like never before. Let your light of revival begin to shine through me like never before. all over the world. And then number eight will be your own private request. You know the area where you need a new dorm. You want to put that as number eight. Well, the way we do it at home is at a stage like this, we declare the altar open. But uh, you can use your chair as your altar, although there is room for quite a few. The altar here is big, and you can see, observe all protocol and see come to the altar from over there to over there and then the rest of us can use a chair as altar i will ask you to pray for only 10 minutes because uh, you will continue pray on your way home but i beg you this is not an ordinary night cry to God. By the time the sun is rising tomorrow, it will not be an ordinary sun rising for you. Amen. Shall we go and pray?
Thank you, Jesus. Let's, let us begin to bring our prayers to a close. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. The Almighty God will grant your requests. From now on, you will begin to enjoy a new dawn of health. Amen. A new dawn of abundance. Amen. From this moment onward, you will become a vessel unto honor in God's hands. He will empower you. Amen. You will win souls. You will heal the sick. Amen. You will set captives free. Amen. You will raise the dead. Amen. You will be an agent of revival. Amen. And God himself will use you mightily. Amen. So shall it be. Amen. In Jesus' mighty name we have prayed. Amen. Amen. Well, let someone shout another hallelujah. We'll remain an attitude of worship as we go back to our seats. Um, while I was preparing for this evening, I asked God if he has a word or two. For those of you who will be listening. And uh, he spoke. Some of the messages he sent, I claim for myself. So I started rejoicing even before I come to tell you. The first thing he said. <clears throat> Is that someone who had listened to us tonight is heading for the best year of his or her life? Yeah. So, can I understand why I said amen to that? <laughs> then he said, that is going to raise up someone to fill the gap left by somebody else in your life. Amen. I think somebody must have, must have a void created in his or her life. He says he will raise up someone who will fill the gap. And then he said there is someone listening to us tonight who is very close to depression. He asked me to tell the fellow where is the 
Where is that one coming from? <laughs> he said, I saw one very close to depression who will soon be leaping for joy. <laughs> then, this one I'm just going to give you the summary. Well, maybe I'll tell you the way it came. He says, son, what is your definition of wonder? And I gave the definition that I, we've always given, including the funny one that I had several years ago when somebody said, <clears throat> a wonder is that which causes you to wonder. <laughs> And another one said, the wonder is that which causes you to open your mouth and you can't close it. Then daddy says, someone will soon say, now I know the true meaning of a wonder. Yeah. Mm -hmm. ah, then he said, there's someone he said, your family will soon welcome the first set of twins. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> I think somebody wanted that one very much. Amen. Then he said, there is someone listening to us tonight. He said, tragedies have become almost normal in your family. He said, that ends tonight. Yeah. Then he said, there is someone listening to us tonight, whoever that fellow may be. He said, your family used to be well known for witch doctors. He asked me to tell you, your family will soon produce a world evangelist. Yeah. Then he said, uh, someone will soon sing, it is well with my soul. Yeah. Then he showed me a vision, that was the last one. And I saw a dam, you know, what a dam, something like that. And as I looked closely, I saw in the wall of the dam a crack. And as I watched, you know, water began to seep through the crack. And the crack was getting bigger and bigger and bigger, so more and more water was flowing. The Lord asked me to tell someone the dam that have been holding back your blessings has already suffered a crack. And before the end of the year, the blessing will start at a trickle, but it will keep on increasing and increasing and increasing. If you receive any of those, will you please shout a really big hallelujah? <clears throat> now, before I come back to Rando with our Thanksgiving and uh, final blessing, we will want to listen to one or two testimonies that are coming. So over to the pastor there. Thank you so much, Daddy. We're grateful for the word. Uh, let's listen to the following testimonies. And if you still have some to share with us, please do email them in uh, right now. The first one. My name is Mrs. Joy Dorothy Olayton. There's a, a ma at FOL. Hallelujah to the Most High God. 
during one of the festival of life, having waited for many years for a resident permit in the country, protocol was suddenly suspended for our sake and amnesty was released for our sake. Instead of renewable visa, we were given an indefinite leave to remain. And this was indeed marvelous in our sight. Many people didn't believe the miracles until they saw with their eyes. God turned our shame to victory and rejoicing as we experienced great turnaround in our lives as a family. Daddy, we are grateful and will return all the glory and thanksgiving to you, the Almighty God alone. Let somebody shout hallelujah. Number two testimonies. Blessed be the name of Jesus. I testify on behalf of my younger sister Abba in Ghana. This is for Mrs. Ruby Kitcher. Six years ago, I attended Festival of Life for the first time at Excel London. I laid a prayer request on behalf of my sister who was trusting God for a child. Her feminine cycle was not consistent and scientifically it was challenging. Daddy Gio asked us to sow a seed. I sowed a seed on behalf of my sister. Again, Daddy told us to pray for, first, for a first-timer's gift and to ask God for three Christmas presents. The God of Festival of Life showed up. Before December 2015, my sister was confirmed pregnant. As the Lord will have it, the baby girl was born in 2016. I have come to testify and to return all glory and honor and praise and adoration to God. Let somebody shout hallelujah. hallelujah. My name is Mrs. Abimbola O. I want to thank God for his faithfulness in my life and family. Eight years ago, I had fibroid removed after believing God for the fruit of the womb for eight years. I came to Festival of Life a week after the operation, even though I wasn't stable and was still bleeding. But believing God for miracle at FOL in October 2013, the first word of wisdom from Daddy Jill was that there is someone here who will never weep again. I shouted and jumped in pain for joy. And everyone sitting around me started congratulating me. My weeping ended that day. I had my son the following year. He's seven years now. John is Sheolua. And God didn't stop there. He blessed us with another beautiful girl. Joanna is Let somebody help me shout hallelujah. <laughs> For Mrs. Tola Onakade, God established my family in United Kingdom. I returned to settle in UK, my country of birth, a little over 21 years ago. I prayed on the altar of FOL with God on my side. He gave his word. In the same year, I returned to my home country to marry my husband, who joined in the UK shortly afterwards. Despite medical report that myself and my husband were both carriers of the sickle cell genotype, God blessed us with four very healthy children that we have no trace of this disease. Come on, let's celebrate Jesus for that. <laughs> Continuously, lately God enlarged our cause by confirming his word, enabling us to buy and move to our own five-bedroom house with three reception rooms during the pandemic. Come on, let's appreciate God. <laughs> Continually, we pray on this altar and we see God's hand and victory in various areas of our lives. In the church that is called us to coordinate healing and career progression. Outstanding testimony in the life of church members and their family. Thank you, Jesus. So grateful for 25 years of FOL. And we're thanking God for our beloved mommy and daddy. Let somebody shout hallelujah. hallelujah. Dear Festival of Life from Ulumide Akomalafe, we want to thank the Almighty God for blessing us with a baby boy in January 2020 after waiting on the Lord for more than five years. 
we attended several FOL and our honest request for God to terminate the blindness in our marriage was granted. We want to thank the Lord Jesus Christ for daddy and mommy, Adeboye, Pastor Leke and Bola Sanusi and everyone who prayed along with us. Praise ye the Lord. This is a wonderful testimony from Miss Grace Summer. All these testimonies were emailed in tonight. I give glory to God for keeping me alive to share my testimony and all other testimonies long overdue. I survived coronavirus. I had the symptoms and nearly ended up in hospital. But I tapped into Daddy Joe's first sermon during lockdown that stated, God said, no member of the redeemed will die except those whose time had come. I looked up and said, Father, my time is not come. And I survived. Come on, let's celebrate Jesus. Let's appreciate him. <laughs> Secondly, in 2018, I made a terrible mistake at work. It was around the time of the minister's conference in Finland. I went hoping to sit on Daddy Jill's chair. However, towards the end, Daddy announced that God asked him to lay hands on everyone. I was overjoyed and instantly knew that the Lord had done it. Since then, the case was never mentioned again. Thank you, Jesus. Finally, a few years ago, I sat on Daddy Gio's chair concerning university admission and financial help for my son at Festival of Life. The following month, the Lord heard and answered our prayer, glory be to God, hallelujah. Let's shout hallelujah. We have so many testimonies tonight. Let me read a few more. From Abimbola Yombo. I want to thank God for the great and mighty things God did in my life. Having an encounter with Daddy Gio in July 2018 at FOL in Scotland. He only said, God will answer all my prayers. Behold, I lost a relationship for five years that same July, August. I was a bit confused because I knew Daddy already prophesied in my life that God will answer all my prayers. But God indeed answered all my prayers. By making me meet my husband in September 2018, come on, God engaged in October 2018, 2018, God married in 2019, gave birth in 2019, I'm also expecting my second child now. Praise ye the living God. Come on, let's praise the living Jesus. This is from one of our pastors, Pastor Eniwaju Etumi. Good evening, sir. In May 2019, our bank that financed a mortgage of 20 year time decided they had lost appetite for religious charity. 10 years into the contractual time, and were meant to pay up a balance of 375,000 by 23rd of October 2019. We had never defaulted in payment of quarterly payments of 12,000 for more than thrice in 10 years. We made all sorts of cases and held many meetings with our relationship manager, but they were, they were adamant. Unfortunately, we had just spent over 100,000 pounds to refurbish the largest hall in the building, including new sound system. There was no money anywhere. We approached another bank immediately, and they were very keen to refinance but the time was so short. So we intensified prayers when we were four weeks to deadline. I called Pastor Good to agree with me for God's intervention. We wrote to the bank for three months extension. They replied with six months extension. In about six weeks, we completed with the new bank at lower interest rates and better terms and conditions. Amen? <laughs> Second testimony, in August 2019, I was privileged to meet Daddy G.O. one-on-one -on -one at the Festival of Life in Moscow, Russia. He agreed with me that my daughter, Adesua Etomi Wellington, will become a mother. She got pregnant in June 2020 and gave birth to an adorable son of God, January this year. His name is Isaiah Wellington. I'm grateful to Jesus for your faithfulness towards me and to daddy. Let somebody shout hallelujah. <laughs> From Olanike Babalola, during the October 2018 London Festival of Life, 
the Lord gave me a word of knowledge through the ministration of Daddy G.O., Pastor Yadeboye, that there is somebody here, the doctor has told you, your liver is adding up, but God said he has given you a brand new liver. I shouted amen and claimed this because I was given that report in August 2018 after two fibroscan results showing hardness and have been scheduled for a liver biopsy in that October, the week after FOL, to determine if the hardness is malignant. I normally have a six monthly review of blood tests which are had in March 2019. I was told that the biopsy report is normal. I had the blood test for review as next appointment in August 2019, which showed that God has started his work. Although I wanted to hear an instant confirmation at that appointment, but God reminded me that some millions are instant, some are gradual. So I kept thanking God for my brand new liver at every opportunity I had. At the August 2019 review, the doctor decided to book another fibro scan for me to be taken at my next appointment. I had the routine blood test to be reviewed. He gave me one year appointment for August 2020, seeing the progress. This encouraged me as I intensified my thanksgiving to the glory of God. I had the appointment in 2020 September instead of August because of the pandemic. And the specialist knows what are. This is a normal and healthy liver. I shouted praise the Lord in the hospital. They asked me what I said. I said praise the Lord. Because the last two measurements went from 7.8 to 9.5. Before the biopsy, it was now 6.2, which was normal. Daddy, thank you very much for your consistency and for your prayers and for reversing the irreversible. Let somebody shout hallelujah. Tonight, one of our sisters here, Yetunde Salami, said that I thank God for sparing my life right in this auditorium. I just got a news while I'm here at the program that the salon I spent close to five hours at was suddenly tonight vandalized by robbers. Thank God for sparing my life. Let somebody shout hallelujah. hallelujah. Uh, there's more, sir, but you can continue. <laughs> It's up to you. Shall we continue or shall we? <laughs> do you want more or do we? Is this, I, can, I can hardly hear these people. I think. Uh, I think they say more. One more, sir. Oh, okay. All right. <laughs> Mrs. Rachel Ajiboye, praise the Lord. The testimony is long overdue, but I need to return all the glory to God as I promised years ago. I lost my first pregnancy at four months, which was a very painful ordeal. The doctors could not determine what caused it. I later waited for months and no pregnancy. We saw the doctors and they said the fibroids in my womb could be the cause. It was a very difficult time that almost destroyed my marriage. Later on, we got a letter to book an appointment with a specialist and on the same day, we were supposed to turn up to the appointment. I found out I was pregnant. Needless to say, we didn't turn up for the appointment again. I was delivered of a lovely baby boy nine months later. I need to mention that we attended Festival of Life at this time. I'm praying and looking up to God. And thank God the Lord won the battle for us today. I'm a joyful mother of two healthy boys. Praise ye the Lord. Amen. Come on, let's put hands together for Jesus and rise up on our feet and just honor God. Come on. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Glory be to God. <clears throat> Uh, you, you need to understand that uh, where I come from, when we come for Holy Ghost night, everything is warm and loud. Uh, so, ministering under the atmosphere of uh, almost silence is <laughs> a bit... Uh, Unusual, let's put it that way. Let me hear somebody shout hallelujah. <laughs> I mean, whether you believe it or not, the God in Nigeria is also the God in the UK. 
and uh, I've said it again and again, if you don't like noise, don't go to heaven. <laughs> heaven is a noisy place. Check your Bible. When they shout hallelujah there, the Bible says it sounds like thunder, like the sound of many rivers. Let me hear one hallelujah like thunder. Thank you. Now we, we want to give our <laughs> we want to give our thanks to God. We do it with rejoicing, with dancing. Uh, let's let's do it the African way, um, with energy. Okay, and then I will, as usual, this being October, we'll give you an opportunity to ask for your Christmas present, and then we close. So. If you need an envelope, as usual, you raise your hand, they give you one. While you are doing all the feelings, I think they will show you on the screen, those of you who are watching, how to go about giving your offering. But in the meantime, let's keep on enjoying the singing and dancing of these wonderful people. Over to you, band. Hallelujah. Amen. Glory be to God. Hallelujah. 25 years of God's goodness, God's faithfulness, yes. God's love. Hallelujah. Amen. Thank you so much, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. Amen. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Lord Jesus.
we make it three. Three major requests as your Christmas present. Three miracles you want God to make available to you before December 25. So you go ahead now, talk to God. Three major miracles, things that God will do that everybody will know only God can do this. And you want these miracles before December 25. Jesus mighty name we have prayed my father my God I want to say thank you thank you for another wonderful night thank you for a new dawn that had already started in the lives of all of us father please accept our thanks in Jesus name father I'm linking my faith with the faith of your children. You are the one who said in your word that if two of us shall agree as touching anything we ask on earth, it will be done for us by our Father in heaven. So Father, I decree based on your word that the three miracles your children have asked for be delivered to them now. Father, I'm asking that even before the end of this month, this your children will already be rejoicing. Amen. And I'm praying, Lord God Almighty, if there be something they should have asked for that they did not remember or didn't know to be more crucial than the one they have asked for, just add it to it in Jesus' name. Amen. Bless your children. Amen. Let it be well with them. Please receive their offering, Amen. sanctify it, Amen. use it for your glory. Amen. And I pray, Lord God Almighty, that these your children will never borrow again. Amen. As those of us who are at various centers will be returning to our various homes, Father, I decree that you will grant us journey mercies, that on our way there will be miracles. Amen. At home, miracles will be waiting for us. And Father, I'm praying that by the next time we have to have FOL, the testimonies will be so many that we will need hours to take them all. Thank you, my Father. And if it pleases you to return before we can have any other FOL, I pray that in your kingdom, none of us will be missing. Thank you, Almighty. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Amen. 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 Well, if you got the biggest done, biggest new done, shout the biggest hallelujah. hallelujah. 